Hello, my name is Javiera Torres and I'm here to talk to you about how do we see color. In the beginning I had the idea of making a presentation about how do we see in general, color, shapes, contrast, depth, and also about the implications of seeing color in nature, in different cultures, pretty ambitious. When I started reading about the topic, I realized I would be lucky if I managed, for starters, to understand and explain in a very simplified way how do we see color. So let's go. There are three main components involved in seeing. The first one is something to see with, what we call visual system. Seeing is a pretty complicated thing and they say we use two eyes and two thirds of the brain to see. So here we have our visual system, which has to be installed in a living being, preferably. The second thing we need is something to see. Objects, things, a world out there. And the third thing we need is light. Well, there are different sources of light. Some artificial, created by man, such as light bulbs or neon lights, and some natural, such as the lightnings, fire, etc. But by far the most important source of natural light on Earth is the Sun. The Sun is essentially a big ball of fire. It is composed mainly by hydrogen, around three quarters, and by helium, the remaining quarter more or less, plus some other elements. I said that the Sun was a big ball of fire, but where does this fire come from? Well, in the Sun, atomic fusion takes place. That is the same source of energy as in the atomic bomb. Nuclei of hydrogen fuse into helium, releasing an enormous amount of energy. This energy leaves the Sun under the form of electromagnetic radiation. And now that we have individualized the three main components of vision, let's examine them one by one. Electromagnetic radiation is quite a complicated thing but it can be simplified saying that it's actually a charged particle which travels through space like a wave. It has two components, the electric one, which oscillates in a direction perpendicular to the propagation of the wave, and the magnetic one, which in turn oscillates perpendicular to the other two. Understood? No? It doesn't matter. We just need to keep in mind this image of an oscillating wave and this distance called the wavelength, which is what we are going to use to separate electromagnetic radiation into different categories. Wavelength is the distance between two consecutive peaks or dots of the wave. A distance. But how big or small is this distance? The answer is, it depends. Let's examine first the different kinds of electromagnetic radiation emitted by our Sun and then study their respective wavelengths. The Sun emits visible light, the light we see. It emits ultraviolet light. This is the light that makes our skin tan and can ultimately cause skin cancer. It emits infrared light. This is basically the radiation emitted by warm bodies, such as ours, and which can be used to detect living creatures in the darkness with special cameras. It emits X-rays, quite energetic and more dangerous than ultraviolet radiation. That's why the dentists leave the room when they take an X-ray of your mouth. It emits microwave waves and radio waves. These kinds of electromagnetic radiation are so classified according mainly to the wavelength, which is long for radio and progressively shorter for microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, and quite short for X-rays. But how long or how short? Well, quite long in the case of radio waves, which can have a distance between peaks of the size of buildings, between meters and centimeters for the microwave waves, for infrareds already quite small, sizes such as the point of a needle measured in microns. If you take a millimeter and divide it into a thousand parts, one part is a micron. Visible electromagnetic radiation has a wavelength of about the size of unicellular organisms, measurable in nanometers. A nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter. Visible light has a wavelength between 400 and 700 nanometers, as we will see later. Ultraviolet radiation has a wavelength of about the size of molecules, 
and that's why it's dangerous. It has a size that allows it to interact with atoms and molecules and to destabilize structures, causing damages. And worse is the damage caused by X-rays, as their wavelength is about the size of atoms, so they interact with matter, ripping off electrons from the atoms. Now, you probably noticed that in the history of knowledge and science, whatever the subject you're interested in, always the same guys pop up. You're studying, let's say, the elements of nature, the human body, the solar system, there you have Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, etc. The same happens with light and color. Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci were interested, and also another guy who was involved in almost everything, Sir Isaac Newton. Yes. He was kind of specialized in formulating complicated theories inspired by simple observations, as the law of universal gravitation watching an apple falling from an apple tree. Well, while interested in light and optics, he wanted to study the origin of color, so he went into a dark room with a prism, and through a hole piercing the wall, he let a ray of sunlight hit the prism. The light? Passing through the prism was decomposed in an array of colors, as it happens with the rainbow. He called this array of colors the spectrum, using the Latin word for appearance or apparition, and even if there are an infinite number of colors, Newton assigned seven colors to the spectrum, in an analogy to the musical scale. These are the same seven colors we used when we were children for drawing the rainbow. Actually, at his time, it was known already that the prism could do that with light, but it was thought that the prism colored the light. By using then a second prism to regroup the array into white light again, Newton proved that the colors were in the light, and the prism only managed to separate them. The prism, actually, separates them according to their wavelengths. So here we have our visual spectrum, with an indication of the different wavelengths. We have the violets, with short wavelengths, such as 400 nanometers, very close to the ultraviolet radiations. We have the greens and the yellow greens, with a medium wavelength, between 500 and 600 nanometers. And the reds, with long wavelengths, between 600 and 700, close to the infrared radiations. We have seen until now an overview about visible light. It is an electromagnetic radiation and it has wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers. The wavelength determines the color, so blues have short wavelength, greens medium, and red long ones. Let's see now how do the objects in the world interact with visible light. There are several kinds of objects according to how they interact with light. In a very simple classification, we can say that there are three kinds. Transparent objects, such as a glass wall. When a ray of light hits some of these objects, it goes through. Reflective objects, such as a mirror. When light hits these surfaces, it's reflected back. And opaque objects, such as a brick wall. When light hits an opaque surface as such, Part of it is absorbed by the object, and part is scattered back, somehow rejected in a disorganized way. And this non-absorbed light is very important for us, because it is this light, the light we see when we look at a certain object, and which defines its color. Let me explain this with three examples. Let's imagine that we have three objects, a tree leaf, an egg, and a dead corpse with a pool of blood. These things have no color, yet. But let's hit them with a ray of white light. This white light, as we saw in the slide about Newton's experiment, contains all the colors. Well, if the white light hits the leaf, the chlorophyll inside of it will absorb the short wavelength light, such as the violets and the blues, and also the long wavelengths, such as the reds. But it won't take the greens and the yellows. These wavelengths will be scattered out of the leaf, and they, by hitting our visual system, will make the leaf appear green to our eyes. In the case of the egg, the yolk contains carotenoids, which absorb the short wavelength radiations, violets and blues, and the greens and reds, but does not absorb the yellow and the orange. As a result, 
The egg yolk and all the things containing carotenoids, such as carrots, pumpkins, etc., appear to us orange or yellow-orange. Blood. Blood contains hemoglobin. When hemoglobin is carrying oxygen, it absorbs all the light but the red. The red is scattered, giving fresh blood its bright red color. Now that we know a bit more about visible light and the way it interacts with objects, let's start explaining in a more detailed way how our visual system works. We will go from big to small, that is, we will start having a look at the eye and then progressively decreasing our scale until observing the cells of the retina at work. It is usually said that the eye pretty much resembles a photo camera. Most probably is the other way around, but the analogy works anyway. If we take an eye and a camera, cut them in half and observe them from up, we see that both have in the front a sort of protective layer, which in the case of the eye is called cornea. Then they have a component which regulates the amount of light that enters. It is the diaphragm in the case of the camera and the iris for the eye, which increases or decreases the diameter of the pupil according to the amount of environmental light. Then we need something to focus with. This is accomplished in both cases with a lens. And then, at the other end of our camera, we have the film, a layer of photosensitive material. And at the other end of our eyes, we have the retina, also a layer of photosensitive cells, neurons actually, which more than a film in a camera, work like a system of sensors and processors in a computer. Let's have a closer look on the retina. We have said that the light enters the eye through the pupil and hits the retina. If we enlarge a small piece of the retina, we can see that over the sclera, the protective coat of the eye, there is a layer of dark, cube-like pigmented cells. These cells are the ones over which the photoreceptive cells are placed, some sort of a neck carton. Also, being pigmented, they absorb the light that is not taken by the photoreceptors, preventing it to be reflected again and again inside the eye, interfering with vision. Over the layer of pigmented cells lie the photoreceptors. There are basically two kinds, the ones resembling cones and the ones resembling rods. They are thus called the cones and the rods. They are neurons, able to transform electromagnetic radiation into a signal that ultimately goes to the brain and tells about color and light intensity, among other things. They do not directly transmit the information to the brain, they transmit it to a series of other neurons in the retina. In a very simplified way, we can say that first, they transmit it to bipolar cells, which are cells having two connecting ends. They receive info from the photoreceptors and transmit it to an upper level. And here we can already see that cones and rods are not equally respected in the retina, for many rods connect to one bipolar cell, while the connection with cones is more one-to-one. -one. These bipolar cells are connected to the ganglion cells, yet another type of neuron which not only receives the info from the bipolar cells, but also processes it a bit before sending it to the brain. Actually, more than sending the information to the brain, they bring it themselves as the optic nerve is formed by the long endings of these cells joined together. Over the layer of ganglion cells lies a net of capillary vessels which carry oxygen and nutrients to take care of all these hard working neurons. The thickness of the retina is not bigger than half a millimeter and the disposition of the layers is somehow funny as light has to pass through all these layers in order to hit the rods and the cones, the cells that actually deal with light. How come we don't see all these layers then? The answer is that we don't see them because our brain tends to erase the permanent stimuli. Or in other words, as they are always there, we don't see them anymore. Hard to believe? If you wear glasses, think about the frame. Do you see it constantly? Probably not. But when you try them for the first time, you certainly did. And so do you when you try somebody else's glasses. But there is something in these layers that we do see. 
Did you ever notice that when you look at the blue sky, sometimes you see little bright things dancing in front of your eyes? They are your white cells, traveling through the capillary vessels. As they move, they are not so constant anymore, and we can notice them, but only against the proper background. But let's focus now on our photoreceptors, the cons and the rods, and examine them in bigger detail. Here we have an enlarged and simplified image of a con and a rod. This part is the one inserted in the pigmented cells, and it is the part that actually detects light. It contains many layers of photopigment, the cons under the form of a single folded layer, and the rods in a pile of discs. This segment of the cell grows constantly, like hair. This part is constantly producing new pigment, which accumulates in the lower part. Then comes the cell body with the nucleus, the organelles, etc. The usual machinery to keep the cell functioning. And at the top end, we have the part that connects with the other neurons and sends info about the light which was detected by the photopigments. But these photopigments, how are they? And how do they work? Each pigment consists basically of two parts. A photosensitive molecule called retinal, which is actually a derivative from vitamin A, did they tell you as a child that eating carrots was good for your sight? Actually, it's right. Carrots contain a lot of vitamin A, which is used to produce retinal, which is one of the main characters in display. Well, retinal reds over a backbone of protein called opsin. When light hits the retinal, it changes its shape and it does not fit in the backbone of protein anymore. As a consequence, the protein becomes active and initiates a chain reaction, which leads to a change in the electrical potential of the membrane of the cell. This electric change sends a message to the upper level neurons. So light starts all this process, but how much light? It depends. For the case of a rod, a single photon is enough to produce a response. But a con needs hundreds of photons to become active. That's why rods are much more effective to see in dim light and darkness, while cons are used during daylight. There is also another good reason to use rods in dim light, a sort of amplification of the signal. Many rods, hundreds of them, are connected to one nervous path to the brain. So it is enough that a photon hits one of these hundred rods to send a signal to the brain. But in the case of the cons, only a few of them are connected together. This lower amplification of the cons means also an improvement in resolution. That's why, using our cons, we can see things like this, clearly, with detail, in color, while using our rods in dim light, we see things like this, with poor definition and in a grayscale. But why do we see in black and white with the rods? We cannot see colors with the rods because they follow what is called the principle of univariance which means that they respond both to the wavelength of the light, that is, its color, and to its intensity, that is, the number of photons, in the same way, variating the electric potential of the membrane. Retinal, the photopigment we saw a couple of slides before, reacts better or has a preference for the light of a certain wavelength. In the case of the rods, keeping the intensity constant, the pigment reacts the most with a wavelength corresponding to cyan. Less for dark blue and green, much less for yellow and almost nothing for orange or red. So if one of our rods receives, let's say, five photons of its favorite light, cyan, it will react this much. But if receives five photons of a light he doesn't like so much, like green, it won't react as much as it did with the cyan light. But if it receives double the intensity of green light, it will react in a very similar way as with half the intensity of cyan, and the brain won't be able to tell if the rod reacted to a very intense green light or to a not so intense cyan light. And that's why the rods cannot see color. Only cons can. But don't the cons have the same problem? How come they can see color? Well, they can see color because we don't have one kind of cons, but three kinds, which photopigment specialized in. Short wavelength lights, the blues, medium wavelength lights, the greens, 
and long wavelength lights, the reds. So here we have our color spectrum with the sensitivity of the rods, as we saw it in the previous slide, and now we can see the sensitivities of the three kinds of cones. With only one kind of pigment we cannot see color, but with three the situation is different. The visual system doesn't work with a single ambivalent response, but with the response of the whole population of different cones, and triangulates the color from it. For example, let's imagine a population of cones with a few of each kind, some more sensitive to blue, others to green, others to red. And let's hit our population with light of different wavelengths in order to see the response of the visual system. If light of a certain wavelength hits the cones and some L cones respond, the visual system evaluates the response of the whole population and thinks, hmm, if only these long cones responded, then the light is probably red. But if a certain light hits the cones and this time not only some L cons respond, but also an M con becomes active, the visual system goes, hmm, the light had the power to stimulate the cons more sensitive to red, but also those more sensitive to green. This light must be somewhere in between red and green, so it must be yellow. So with this triangulation, the visual system comes up with the color of the light. But how does it deal with the intensity? To determine intensity, the visual system computes how many photoreceptors are responding. So if some red are responding, the visual system thinks, OK, this is red, some L are responding. But if all respond, then the visual system thinks this must be really an intense red. So summarizing, we have one kind of rods, very sensitive to light, which we use to see in the darkness and three kinds of cones, which we use to see in daylight and which allow us to see in color. These cones being specialized in reacting to red, green and blue. Red, green and blue, RGB. This is the color system used by most television and computer screens to present color, using the ability of our visual system to compose a big array of colors with different combinations of these three but more about this perhaps in another presentation. So cones do see in daylight, see color and allow high resolution vision, while rods see in low light conditions, see in black and white and have low resolution. But how many of them do we have? Well, numbers are approximate, but they say we have around 5 or 6 million cones and 120 million rods. So more or less 24 rods per cone which makes sense considering the resolution and amplification processes of the rods we saw in the previous slides. And how are they distributed in the retina? In order to answer this question, let's ask ourselves how do we see in detail? For example, how do you read? When you read, do you keep your eyes very open trying to catch the whole page or do you move your eyes from word to word? You probably do the second thing. Move your eyes from word to word even if you are able to see, to have an image of the whole page without doing so. The reason for this is that we want each word we are reading to fall into the field of vision of a special area of the retina called the fovea. The fovea is approximately 2 mm wide and allows us to see with great acuity. But why? Because it's composed only by cones, no rods allowed. And the cones there are very special, very thin and densely packed together to fit as many as possible. They have also a privileged connection with the neurons of the upper level. We saw that the average was of 6 cones per connection. Well, in the fovea the connection is almost one to one in order to allow the best possible resolution. And in order to improve the resolution even more, the connections and the secondary and support cells are spread apart towards the outside of the fovea, so the light doesn't have to pass through all these non-sensitive layers as everywhere else in the retina before reaching the photopigment. So if we make a rough sketch of the back of our eyes, we have the fovea, this area of densely packed cones specialized in accurate vision. Surrounding the fovea, we have a ring densely populated by rods. Here is where most of these many millions of rods are. 
This ring gives us the ability to see in dim light and it's used for example by the astronomers in order to observe a dim star or galaxy. And then we have the rest of the cones and the rods distributed in a less concentrated way which enables peripheral vision. Peripheral vision is specialized in detecting movement. Outside the fovea, we don't have so many cones to support very accurate or detailed vision, but we do have the feeling of somehow being able to see quite well outside the fovea. That is because our brain is sort of putting makeup on what we really perceive, filling in the blanks. So peripheral vision is more a cognitive process than anything else. Do you find it hard to believe? One way to experience it by yourself is to try a blind spot teaser. What is the blind spot? The blind spot is the place where the optic nerve leaves the eye in direction to the brain. It has no photoreceptor cells, so technically speaking it cannot see. It's located here. But do you detect any blind area in your vision? No. That's because the brain is filling the blanks. Try searching for a blind spot teaser in the internet and check it out. It's pretty amazing. And so we have arrived to the end of our presentation. Thank you for your attention and see you next time.